The History of Shahrazad, written by Namata GG3. To this day, Shahrazad remains a unique and infamous card. However, few players are familiar with its long and colorful past. I hope you find the history of this card as interesting as I do. I'll start with the flavor of the card. Arabian Nights was the first expansion for Magic. It introduced some interesting cards. This is the set that gave us such historical gems as Moorish Cavalry and Jihad. It also contained Aladdin, Aladdin's Lamp, and Aladdin's Ring. That doesn't seem too odd, until you consider that Disney's Aladdin had just come out on video cassette a month or two before the set's release. It suffices to say, the paradigm for Magic's flavor was completely different back then. Shahrazad is the name of a main character from classical piece of medieval Arabic literature, 1001 Nights. The spelling of the name itself is pretty interesting. Rather than using the correct scholarly transliteration of the name, Shahrazad, Richard Garfield and the other magic designers decided to use the same stylized spelling used in the translation by Sir Richard Francis Burton, a legendary adventurer slash philosopher known for infiltrating Mecca, publishing the Kama Sutra in the West, and serving as a captain in the East India Company, among many other things. Shahrazad's role in the story is that of the narrator. After betraying her husband, the King Sharia, she tells them stories to delay her execution. That is to say, she tells a story within a story, just like Sharizad, the card, creates a game within a game. Also, each story ends with a cliffhanger, so that the story never really ends. Doesn't that remind you of how the card works in a game of magic? If you're about to lose, just pull out Sharizad and play endless games so that you never get executed. It really is an amazingly flavorful card. The art on the card is awesome too. It oozes flavor. It may be a little cartoonish compared to the quality of the cards now, but look at Giant Strength, Celestial Prison, Word of Command, Pyramids, or most of the cards of the time for that matter. They didn't exactly have the same standards then as they do now. Now look at that lamp on Sharazad. The magic lamp story is so overdone that you don't really get to see a lamp used as an actual lighting device anymore. But you do on Sharazad. Plus, how many other cards have a woman beckoning to you from a bed? Here's a final interesting tidbit. Tobacco wasn't introduced to Persia until the Europeans brought it back from America. Therefore, since 1001 Nights comes from a long time before this, the hookah in the foreground marks the first, and to my knowledge, only depiction of cannabis use on a magic card. Okay, that's probably more than you ever wanted to know about the flavor of a card. Yet, that's just the start of the story of Sharazad. Let's discuss how the card itself has been used and abused since it was printed 20 years ago. When magic was first created, nobody imagined what it would become. It was printed with the assumption that local groups would just buy a few cards. There wasn't supposed to be more than one or two of any given rare in the few hundred groups of hardcore role-playing slash hobby enthusiasts that would actually buy more than the starter sets. When Arabian Nights was printed, the game had been out for about three months. It was starting to take off, but so far only Alpha and Beta had been printed, and the assumption that rares would actually be rare still held. In fact, there wasn't even a four in a deck rule. It just wasn't necessary, because it was impossible to get that many copies of a rare. Unless you were some sort of technology wizard, you probably hadn't even heard of the internet, let alone online shopping. If you lived in a major city that actually had a hobby store, they wouldn't have even thought to sell individual cards from the game Magic the Gathering. You can imagine why those who are lucky enough to have those cards are able to sell them for thousands of dollars today. So where does Sharazad fit in? Well, it made the card usable. Fun and balanced, even. If somebody actually had a Sharazad in their deck, they probably just had the one. On the rare occasion somebody played it, it just added an interesting element of diversion to the game. Once the card hit the graveyard, it was probably going to stay there. 
the players had roughly the same chance of winning the sub-game as they did of winning the main game. Of course, every statement in this paragraph became completely untrue as the game evolved. Let's go through them. It made the card usable, fun and balanced even. Charizard is the only card outside of anti-cards to be banned in every wizard sanctioned format. Sure it's a weird crazy card, but why did it get banned? Keep reading. If somebody actually had a Charizard in their deck, they probably only had one. On the rare occasion somebody played it, it just added an interesting element of diversion to the game. As magic grew, this became completely untrue. People started fine-tuning decks and collecting multiples of powerful cards. The four of a card limit had to be introduced. Playing a sub-game of magic once every few games might be fun, but playing two or three sub-games in every game is just tiresome. This brings the most terrifying element of Charizard to the table. If you have more than one in your deck, you can play a sub-game within a sub-game. This is very tiresome. If you thought the film Inception was confusing, try keeping track of three or more sets of life totals in a magic game with multiple copies of Charizard. It's not as fun as it sounds, and it doesn't sound all that fun. Once the card hit the graveyard, it was probably going to stay there. In the original game of Magic, the graveyard was not nearly as much a part of the game as it is now. Today's Exile Zone is more accessible than the graveyard of those times. Occasionally a creature might gruesomely be returned from the dead by black magic, but that creature probably got to the graveyard the fair way, by dying in combat. When it came to reusing spells, only the unique green spell regrowth could do that, although the temporal manipulation of Time Twister could also do it in a roundabout way. If anybody ever did make a Sharazad regrowth deck, I'm sure it was a great joke, but quickly became unpopular. Two or three games is just tiresome. Nowadays, cards in the graveyard are almost as easy to play as cards in your hand, if not easier. If somebody does have a Sharazad recursion deck, you can expect to play two or three sub-games every single turn of the main game. Ugh. Not to mention that it can be easily copied by spells like Fork. That's not even considering the possibilities of sub-games within sub-games. I shudder to think. The players had roughly the same chance of winning the sub-game as they did of winning the main game. This brings us to a part of Sharazad's history that many players are not familiar with. For a time, Sharazad was one of the most powerful cards in Magic. When Sharazad was printed, the Exile Zone hadn't been invented yet. In fact, Arabian Nights introduced the concept of manipulating cards outside the game with Ring of Maruf, a concept so radical at the time that they italicized the words outside the game on the original card just to show how awesome it was. Then Antiquities brought us Bronze Tablet, a card so bizarre you'll just have to look it up yourself. Basically, removing stuff from the game was weird back then. Then, after Legends, the Dark came along and made removing from the game a regular thing, but not nearly as prevalent as Exile is now. When stuff got removed from the game back then, it was really gone. In fact, if it got removed from the game during a Sharazad sub-game, it was gone in the main game too. As graveyard recursion and removing from the game became more commonplace, Sharazad became not only a nuisance, it was one of the first banned cards, but it also became a powerhouse. As soon as you could resolve a Sharazad, you could just slowly pick away at an opponent's library within sub-games until their deck was removed from the game. Then you would just win the main game due to the empty library draw rule. Another potential abuse strategy was to use Sharazad in a tournament sideboard. You would win the first game of a match as normal, on your deck's own merits. However, in sideboarding your deck would transform. Rather than trying to win, you would try to drag the game out forever, resulting in a draw for the second game of the match due to time constraints, and an overall match win. Sadly, stalling and delaying is still a tactic sometimes employed by more unscrupulous tournament competitors, but Sharazad made it absurdly easy and effective. The process of mulligan taking for a single game alone could eat up several minutes. This potential for abuse is what ultimately led to the banning of Sharazad in vintage and legacy formats. For a long time, Sharazad was up there with Contract from Below, 
as terrifyingly powerful cards that would dwarf the power 9 if only they were legal. Of course, with the introduction of the Exile Zone, cards exiled by Sharazad now return to the original game, taking away its extreme power, though not its extreme capacity to annoy. For years, most copies of Sharazad lay squirreled away in binders, unused and forgotten. With it being banned in all formats, Sharazad would very rarely show up in an actual game, and even then, only as an eccentric naught. Sharazad has enjoyed a resurgence in popularity lately. For a short time, the card was allowed in the official Elder Dragon Highlander rules. The single card rule prevented game within a game headaches. The casual tone of the format makes delaying tactics pointless. Furthermore, EDH is the perfect place to use strange and silly old cards. Unfortunately, those in charge of the official EDH rules realise that the average player can't be trusted not to copy and recast Charizard and run games into oblivion, and it has again become an outlaw in all sanctioned formats. So what's the situation with Charizard now? Well, for one thing, it's valuable. You can expect to pay about $40 for a used one, and even more for one in mint condition. Ironically, it's also much easier to obtain than it used to be 20 years ago. The savvier internet shopper could arrange to have one sent directly to his or her mailbox at the lowest available price in the world within a minute of finishing this sentence. In the rare circles of friends that can resist the urge to ruin games with it, Sharazad is even cast in EDH or casual games every now and then. Hi guys, thanks for checking out the history of Sharazad. If you want to read the original text, you can find it in the description. This episode was illustrated by the very talented Jesse Quist. Today's honourable mention is Unseen, an article by Mark Rosewater, the head designer of Magic, about a set that was never released.